Hello, hello! Welcome back to Supposedly Fun. I am Greg, here today to talk about the results of the 2019 Booker Prize. So, interestingly, I was actually in my car driving to a doctor's appointment when they were making the announcement, so I loaded the live stream on Facebook before I started driving and was listening to it as, as I was going along. What a dramatic thing to be listening to as you're driving. I, I could tell as the ch uh, chairperson of the jury was uh, getting into his discussion that it sounded like he was lead leading into having two winners, and sure enough, he was. I knew right away as he started talking about the books that Ducks Newbury Port was not going to be winning because as he was running through the uh, shortlisted books, it felt like he went much harder into praise of Ducks Newbury Port than he did for the others. So it almost felt like we really liked this book, but it, it's not going to win. And we're, because we're almost like we're going to stop talking about this book. So just know that we loved it right away. So I knew Ducks Newburyport wasn't going to win. I had an idea that two were, that were coming. It was still shocking. Mostly it was shocking because one of the two books was The Testaments by Margaret Atwood. And, you know, I have such mixed feelings about this because I like, I like Margaret Atwood. I've only actually read one of her books. I, I, I like a lot of what she does, but it feels like the win is much more for wh who Margaret Atwood is and what her book represents for this moment in time, especially politically. And I don't really know how I feel about Well, I know how I feel about that. I don't quite like that. It feels like there was always an intention to, to reward uh, the Testaments. Obviously, that's not 100% the case. They, they didn't just decide, uh, for political reasons, we're going to give it to the Testaments and that's what we're doing. They did have advanced copies of the Testaments in order to put it on the long list and get it on the short list. So they had read it. It's not like it's just for the political statement. I'm sure they, and I'm sure they liked it. But it just feels like overall there was this sense that that's the direction they were always wanting to go. So having there be two winners and having one of them be the testaments just feels like, but why, <laughs> you know? And I don't, I, I even in the uh, the Booker Prize, I posted something on Instagram after the fact where they had the chairperson for the jury talking about the two winners, and kind of smugly talking about how they threw the rules out to, to uh, award the book to two of them, but then he makes a kind of token comment about the other winner, girl, woman, other, and then. Most of what he says after that feels very specifically pointed at the Testaments, not Girl, Woman, Other. So it just feels like from day one, they always knew an award was going to the Testaments. And then you could get into like conspiracy theorizing about this. I did a little bit because I feel like it seems like from the beginning, they were always going to give an award to the Testament. So then it feels like people really, somebody on the jury was really making a push for Girl, Woman, Other instead. Maybe even consensus was going toward Girl, Woman, Other. But somebody on the jury wouldn't let the Testaments go. That's the only way they could have gotten, come to such an impasse. Britta Bowler pointed out on Twitter after the announcement yesterday that there are five judges that you can't have a tie when there's an odd number of judges. So how does that happen? And part of me wonders what, it, there's only one man on the jury and it happens to be the chairperson. So I kind of speculate in my mind, what if the person who really wouldn't let go of the testaments is the chairperson for the jury? That in that scenario, they would have the, the quote unquote power and authority to push it forward even when everybody else is going for girl, woman, other. And I just think that's disappointing. I feel like it steals a lot of the thunder from Girl, Woman, Other and this and Bernardine Evaristo. I will say, I think Margaret Atwood, who, by the way, has already won a Booker Prize for The Blind Assassin, right here. I feel like even Margaret Atwood got up there and seemed a little embarrassed that she was up there. She was extremely gracious and uh, yielded the floor to Bernardine Evaristo about, after making a joke about them both having curly hair. Um, she did say in there that she didn't feel like she needed the attention, which is something I have mixed feelings about because just because you are an established author, just because you have already won an award doesn't mean you, you know, you die. 
doesn't mean you just go away and you can't ever win another award ever. I, I certainly don't feel that way. And if the if it felt like the Testaments really was the best book of the bunch, I wouldn't have as much of a problem with this or in the league. But the, the feedback I've seen about it. I had actually resigned myself to reading the Testaments, and then the feedback I got about it here on in my corner of BookTube, at least, pushed me back into the idea of like, well, I don't feel like I need to read this. So, I feel like Margaret Atwood is great. I don't really know what I feel. And she was very gracious. All respect to her for the way she handled the situation. Um, then you get Bernardine Evaristo up there. And she is the first black woman to win the Booker Prize, which she pointed out in her speech. And it feels like, and I don't think it was this, I, I, I'm going to say this, but I don't think it was the intention of the jury for the Booker Prize to do this. But it feels like we always temper the achievements of people of color. We temper the achievements of black women and try to make them less than something else. And it feels, I, I don't think that was what the, the jury intended to do. I don't think they said, well, we're gonna give it to the first black woman, but we have to put a white person in there. I don't think that's what they were trying to say at all. But by having a tie, they took away what should have been this great moment for Bernardine Evaristo. And again, Bernardine Evaristo was very gracious about Margaret Atwood. She gave a really great speech. Uh, she understood what her win represented and what it meant to have mostly women and some women of color on the jury as well. Like she, she understood all of that and I think she got that across really well. It just feels like, and I haven't read either book yet, so it's, I'm, I, I feel like I'm talking out of turn to a degree. But even when they announced the long list, this is the book that jumped out to me the most. Even more than Duck's Newbery Report, which I am currently reading. Um, this is the one that I immediately wanted to read. When it got on the short list, I felt happy for it, even though I haven't read it. So if you have not heard, this is 12 very different, uh, it's set in Britain, it's very 12 very different people, mostly women, mostly black, who call it home. Teeming with life and crackling with energy, girl, woman, other follows them across the miles and down the years. With vivid originality, irrepressible wit, and sly wisdom, Bernardine Evaristo presents a gloriously new kind of history for this old country, ever dynamic, ever expanding and utterly irresistible. I'm just so interested in this. Uh, it's, so, it's the stories of 12 different women, some of them black, some of them white, uh, I believe some of them queer, some of them not, um, interacting and finding their place and dealing with representation. And to me, that is such an interesting story. And I admit, I, I still cling to the idea that The Handmaid's Tale does not need a sequel. It was really good the way it was. And, Given the choice between the two of them, I'm absolutely going to read this. This is the one I bought. I didn't even get the testament from the library. Um, oddly, because it's from the library, I'm reading Duck's Newbury Report at the moment instead of this. But this is, like I said, the one that jumped out to me the most and said, this is the really urgent book on this long list and then on this short list that I want to read and that I feel it is important for our time. So... That's kind of where I'm at with this. And by the way, uh, speaking of Bernardine Evaristo, I just called my local indie before I started recording this to order another book of hers because I was looking further into her backlist this morning and I found, I'm sorry, I'm going to refer to my Goodreads, a book of hers called Mr. Loverman, which I am absolutely going to read. I ordered, Like I said, I ordered it. So it's about Barrington Jedediah Walker, Barry to his friends, trouble to his wife. 74 years old, Antiguan born and bred, I hope I pronounced that right, he's from Antigua, I guess, in the Caribbean. 74 years old, Antiguan born and bred, flamboyant hackney personality, Barry is known for his dapper taste and fondness for retro suits. He is a husband, father, and grandfather. And for the past 60 years, he has been in a relationship with his childhood friend and soulmate, Morris. Wife Carmel knows Barry has been cheating on her, but little does she know what is really going on. When their marriage goes into meltdown, Barrington has big choices to make. Mr. Loverman is a groundbreaking exploration of Britain's older Caribbean community, which explore, explodes cultural myths and fallacies, and shows how deep and far-reaching the consequences of prejudice and fear can be. It is also a warm-hearted, funny, and life-affirming story about a character as mischievous, cheeky, and downright lovable as any you'll ever meet. I read that description, and I... Just from the first paragraph, the second it got into the fact that this dude had been having a secret gay affair with his best friend for 60 years, I was in. Done. 
So it just feels like this should be a wonderful moment for Bernardine Evaristo, who is a lesser known author, who by all accounts deserves the spotlight. The feedback I've gotten on this book has largely been positive. Britta Bowler had a review um, that was a little more negative, and I, I think she had some very good pointed critiques of it that I'm going to take into this book when I read it. I am going to read this by the end of the year, I am promising myself, because I really, really want to. Um, so, but, uh, and by the way, if you don't follow, follow Britta Bowler on Twitter, you are missing out. Follow her on Twitter. She had really great reactions to the Nobel Prize announcement last week on Twitter and really great reactions to this situation as well. So, anyway, there you go. Take that, take that recommendation if you will. It's made my life richer. But anyway, I'm really excited for Bernardine Evaristo. I'm very happy that Girl, Woman, Other One. As for the Testaments, not so much. And I feel bad about that because, as I said, I really, I really like Margaret Atwood, and I don't subscribe to this notion that just because you have won something in the past means you should just go away and not, not expect to receive any praise or any rewards in the future. You're still a valid person out there. Uh, Margaret Atwood has done great things in literature, um, and she's she's also a great personality on Twitter and in the media, so I definitely want her out there. I don't think anything that happened is her fault, and I haven't read the Testament, so it feels weird trying to insinuate that she didn't deserve it, but again, the book I gravitated to on the long list and then the short list the most was always Girl, Woman, Other, followed by Duck's Newber Report, so it feels like if there were gonna be two winners, shouldn't it have been Girl, Woman, Other and Duck's Newber Report? Wouldn't that be better? Wouldn't we all be much happier today <laughs> if not for that? So, you know, and by the way, I, I, I am only 75 pages into Ducks and Uber Report so far, and I'm really liking it. I'm surprised because I was very nervous about the, um, uh, the narrative and the way it flows. I, I'm blanking on the term, but it's when you think, you, stream of consciousness, that's it. Um, the stream of consciousness style. I will say, I don't know if it's me. I don't think like this. I don't, because it's, because it's stream of consciousness and I don't have the book with me, I, I, I don't think, like, I, the word remember doesn't send me uh, my thoughts on the, on a whole train where I'm like, remember, remember, the fifth of, <laughs> and, and uh, the uh, Guy Fawkes Day. Uh, it does, that's not how my brain works. Am I weird? I'm enjoying it. I like it. I'm surprised that it flows really well. Um, and I'm looking forward to getting further into it. Will it sustain that energy for the entire thousand pages? I don't know. That's 75 pages is like a drop in the water. <laughs> a drop in the water. A drop in the ocean of that. So we'll see how that goes. But yeah, I'm really excited to get to Girl, Woman, Other. And then just, uh, I, I hope that this is a kind of conversation you guys enjoy. I feel like I'm starting to turn into a little bit of the guy who does hot takes on things. Um, it's interesting, some of, the, some of the feedback I got on the uh, Nobel Prize for Literature video that I did last week, um, most people kind of agreed. There were a couple of people who had some arguments on the other side and said mo most of the arguments on the other side just were that you have to take the author for their work and not for their politics, except I don't really believe that you can 100% take an author's politics out of their work. Because even they were using Gabriel Garcia Marquez as an example, because Gabriel Garcia Marquez was friends with Fidel Castro, which is true. Fidel Castro was one of his proofreaders. That is absolutely true. And when you look at a novel like 100 Years of Solitude, that really gets into the political history of South America, the political future of South America, and the isolationist idea or uh, versus the idea of coming out onto the world stage. All of those things which are in the novel are informed by the author. Now, this is not always the case. An author can absolutely take, you know, devil's advocate and try to argue for a different side. But by and large, it's reflected in there. So you can't, to me, like they were trying to say, Gabo Garcia Marquez, mic drop. But I, I don't believe you can separate Gabo Garcia Marquez's politics because it's right there in the book. And the other point of that was that the Nobel Prize is awarded for literature. But politics comes into it. You cannot tell me that there isn't politics involved in the way the Swedish Academy chooses who gets the prize and when. My examples were Svetlana Alexeyevich. She is a journalist primarily, and 
awarding her a prize validates decades of her work and the stories of suffering that she was sharing with the world. She couldn't even be published in the country where she is from. Um, Nadine Gordimer won a Nobel Prize for Literature, and I think she deserved it anyway. I have not read Nadine Gordimer, but from everything I've, re I've heard about her, and she's an author I really want to get to, um, she deserved the prize anyway, but she won it in 1991, when the debate over apartheid was still swirling in South Africa. You, and you can't tell me that these things aren't political choices. These aren't political statements that the Swedish Academy was trying to make. So if you want to tell me that we can't put politics on the Nobel Prize for Literature, then the Swedish Academy should definitely be taking politics out of it as well. And I don't think we can say that they have. I mean, even Winston Churchill won a Nobel Prize. And the statement that came with it uh, talked about him defending exalted virtues, which is politics. So I feel like everything about it is a political process. You cannot separate the Nobel Prize for Literature from politics. They are together. And a couple of leading into... So interestingly, uh, going back to Britta Bowler, because I'm, apparently I'm a huge fanboy for her lately... Um, she talked about getting some negative comments on her channel, and I commented to say that I hadn't. I, I was fortunate not to have those. Well, boy, did I jinx myself because they have been coming out in force, and the, it's not helpful. There were a lot of comments on that video as well that basically called me stupid or ranted about left wing media conspiracy theories and things like that. And you know, if you come at me with a valid critique or comment. I will respond to you and we will have a conversation. If you comment and just say this is stupid, you are going to get blocked from the channel because there's no point in me engaging with you. So this is just to say, maybe let's all try to be civil. And if you disagree with me, I invite conversation about these things. I don't pretend to be an expert in any of this. I'm just a dude who propped my phone up so I can talk into it and post it online. I am not an expert in anything. I like to think I have a point of view. Hopefully people appreciate it. Maybe they don't. I don't know. So if you want to talk to me about it, I invite that. But if you want to just kind of name call, maybe don't. Maybe don't. So, anyway. <laughs> All that just to say, I hope you've enjoyed this. I would love to know what you think about the situation. Do you think the Testaments deserved to be a co-winner should it have been the winner winner do you agree with me that probably maybe bernard dean evaristo should have been the only winner of the prize this year that's what i think <laughs> do you want to jump down the rabbit hole and tell me your conspiracy theory about how we ended up with two winners i'm pretty convinced that the chairperson for the jury was pulling hard for the testaments and that's the only way we could have gotten to this point where there was a, t a deadlock and a tie with five people Five people. There's no There's no way to have a tie with five people. So, I don't know. I'd love to hear your conspiracy theory, what you think of these, if maybe you're in the camp of orchestra of minorities. <laughs> or maybe you're just sad for Duck's Newbury Port. Let's all be sad for Duck's Newbury Port, because the audacity of a book like Duck's Newbury Port and the fact that it has been so celebrated, and we probably came close to a win, that's great. So, let's all be sad for Duck's Newbury Port. Drop a comment down below with how you feel about this whole thing. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. Again, let's all just love each other. I was going to say let's all be kind, but that's kind of an Ellen DeGeneres thing, and she's a little, you know, that's a whole other issue right now. So I'm just going to leave it alone for now and say I'll be back. Until then, happy reading.